Hello, everybody, and welcome back to What's the Word? Today is Tuesday, March 9th, 2021. And today, the word comes from John chapter 1, verse 5, out of the New Living Translation. And it reads, The light shines on in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. And from that, I want to say, just keep your light. A lot of people will try to pour on their negativity or their darkness on you, but just know that light always wins out in the end. Kicking things off with Georgetown, who on Saturday lost to UConn 98-82. to Stop me if you've heard this one before. The Hoyas didn't make a lot of shots in the first half of the game. This time around, they only hit six shots from the floor in the opening 20 minutes, tallied one assist, and trailed 51-24 to at the break. It was a tale of two halves for Georgetown as they bounced back to score 58 after halftime, but it became nearly impossible to overcome UConn's lead, which had grown to 29 in the opening moments of the second half. Georgetown's Javon Blair scored a game-high 22 points in his second game coming off the bench after being notably absent from the DePaul game at the end of February, not 100% sure what to make of his demotion. But overall, the loss plus Providence pulling off the upset over number 10 Villanova pushes Georgetown to the 8th seed in the Big East Tournament. Speaking of which, next up for the Hoyas is the tournament and their action will get underway tomorrow as they face 9th seed Marquette at 3 p.m. As for Maryland, they lost their game to Penn State on Sunday, 66-61, marking their second consecutive loss after a five-game winning streak. Maryland had an opportunity to finish with a conference record above 500, but instead, with the two consecutive losses, they finished 9-11 in the Big Ten and 15-12 overall. The Terps got out to another hot start with a 12-0 lead as Penn State missed their first nine shots of the game. Maryland grew their lead to 16 during the half and entered the break up 33-23. The Nittany Lions trailed by 14 with under 10 minutes remaining, but they kept their composure, fought all the way back to take their first lead with a minute and 23 left, and they wouldn't let go. The Terps shot 47% for the game, but their offense ran dry when they needed it most. They were also outdone at the charity stripe, as Penn State made more free throws in the second half with 18 than Maryland attempted all night as they shot 7 of 13, or 53%. So, free throws were the difference. As I mentioned last week, a loss plus Rutgers defeating Minnesota would push Maryland to the 8th seed, and that's exactly what happened. Next up for them, they will start the Big Ten tournament on Thursday, as they face 9th seed Michigan State at 11.30 a.m. In other Maryland basketball news, their women's team has won the Big Ten regular season title, so congratulations to them. The Washington Capitals wrapped up their two-game set with the Boston Bruins on Friday, losing by a score of 5-1. In Wednesday's matchup between the two teams, Boston's Trent Frederick did his best to get under Alex Ovechkin's skin by continuously putting the body on him, attempting to drop the gloves, and yes, even the $5,000 play where Ovechkin speared Trent Frederick between the legs started with two cross checks from Frederick. After the first game in the two-game set, Frederick said he was playing Ovi hard out of respect, but Washington's Tom Wilson had other ideas, saying Frederick was targeting the Capitals' captain. Fast forward to Friday, where Tom Wilson delivered this hit to Boston's Brandon Carlo and drew the ire of just about every Bruins player. Off, and here's the hit on Carlo. Here comes Wilson. He's not skating, Joe. He follows through on him. His glove catches his face. It wasn't his shoulder. And that's when all... That leads to the question, was the hit illegal? Brandon Carlo's head hit off the glass and he was injured on the play, but no penalty was called. Tom Wilson wasn't charging, didn't leave his feet to deliver the hit, and in my opinion, he didn't initiate contact through Carlo's head. He hit the shoulder, but Brandon Carlo happened to drop his head as Tom Wilson was following through on the check. There wasn't really any ill intention on this hit. Uh, Tom Wilson wasn't chasing after a smaller player. Brandon Carlo was six foot five, two hundred and twenty seven pounds, outweighing Tom Wilson by seven pounds and two inches. But still, the NHL's Department of Player Safety offered Tom Wilson an in-person hearing for boarding. And again, there wasn't any penalty called on the game, so they had to make that ruling themselves. 
The rule on boarding for the NHL, Rule 41.1, says the onus is on the player applying the check to ensure his opponent is not in a defenseless position. And again, if you look at the rule, it does also say that in certain cases, they should deem that the opponent, or in this situation, Carlo, changed the position of his body or head, putting himself in the vulnerable position. But the hearing proceeded anyway, and precedent for in-person hearings says that Tom Wilson could be suspended five games or more. And obviously, Tom Wilson's reputation precedes himself throughout the league as, quote, a dirty player, with four previous suspensions totaling 23 games and $979,674 in fines. The score was already 1-0 in Boston's favor at that point, but the Bruins obviously took exception and poured it on afterwards. Tom Wilson had to drop the gloves twice from there on, the first time against 6'6", 205 pound Jared Tenorti, whose dad actually played with the Capitals in the late 90s, including playing on the Stanley Cup team in 99. But bias aside, Tenorti probably got the upper hand in this fight, but it was pretty close. The fight didn't affect the manpower advantage, but Boston scored twice with Tom Wilson in the penalty box and lit the lamp again before the end of the second stanza. The Bruins scored again to start the third period, and seven seconds later, Tom Wilson was once again called upon to answer for himself, this time versus 6'2", 203-pound Trent Frederick. Um, and Tom Wilson won this fight, but he was definitely gassed at the end. Lost in all the fighting, Vitek Vanacek had a poor outing in net, giving up four goals on 18 shots, and he was pulled in favor of Ilya Samsonov towards the end of the second period. Samsonov faced seven shots, making six saves, and I'll let you in on a little bit of a nerd alert. Um, I tend to simulate these games the day of, and honestly, I had Ilya Samsonov starting, not because I thought Vitek Vanacek did a bad job, against the Bruins, obviously um, in the game on Wednesday, he only allowed one goal, but it got to a shootout. So that's a lot of minutes in net. And I just thought that Ilya Samsonov should have gotten the start, but obviously he didn't. Also lost in all the chaos was Nicholas Backstrom recording his 700th career assist on Jacob Vrana's third period goal. Backstrom becomes the first player in Capitals franchise history to do so, the third active player, the 54th in NHL history, and he now sits just 13 assists away from top 50 all-time in the category. After the game, Tom Wilson was suspended seven games and will forfeit a total of $311,781 for his hit on Brandon Carlo, but I completely disagree and every player and coach for the Capitals disagreed. The NHL's Department of Player Safety's full explanation will be in the video description if you want to watch it, but what I didn't like was him citing Tom Wilson's quote, substantial disciplinary record. Considering the fact that Tom Wilson is no longer considered a repeat offender, uh, the NHL says repeat offenders um, last up to 18 months after the last suspension, and Tom Wilson was last suspended in October of 2018, so I really didn't like that they mentioned his disciplinary record, and as I said all along, this was really just a reputation suspension for Tom Wilson, but unfortunately, um, and head coach Peter Laviolette said the same thing. Not only will Tom Wilson have to start looking at hits like this, but maybe the league should disallow any type of hit that comes near the boards. That brought us to Sunday, where the Capitals bounced back, defeating the Philadelphia Flyers 3-1. to The Flyers opened the scoring and looked like the better team for the first 20 minutes of play, but the Capitals found their footing in the second period. Alex Ovechkin evened the score with his eighth goal of the season, and his fellow countryman Dmitry Orlov found the back of the net to give Washington the 2 1 lead 16 seconds before the second intermission. Nick Jensen made it three unanswered goals for the Caps with his tally four minutes into the final frame, and the Philadelphia Flyers were handed the loss with their fans in attendance for the first time all season. Ilya Samsonov got the start in net and stopped 36 of the 37 shots he faced. The Capitals will be back in action today as they host the New Jersey Devils at 7 p.m. The NBA's All-Star Game took place on Sunday with Team LeBron defeating Team Durant 170-150. to 
The league's worst fears almost came true as Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons were held out due to contact tracing after a barber they used in Philadelphia tested positive for COVID. Fortunately, up to this point, nobody has tested positive, so that's the good news. But, you know, this is really the, the reason that players didn't want to play. And Bradley Beal led us into a little bit of a secret, saying that the reason the game was played is that it's in the players' CBA that an All-Star game has to be held every season. Speaking of Bradley Beal, he dropped 26 points on 10 of 16 shooting, going 6 of 12 from 3. He added 4 assists, 2 rebounds, a steal, and a turnover, and was a minus 5 in his 31 minutes of action. He was also the leading scorer for Team Durant and the 4th highest scorer overall, falling behind Giannis Antetokounmpo, Damian Lillard, and Steph Curry. Speaking of Giannis, he was named MVP with 35 points, going perfect from the floor, 16 of 16, and 3 of 3 from 3, which is really surprising for Giannis. He added 7 rebounds, 3 assists, a steal, and a block in his 19 minutes of play. As for the rest of the All-Star festivities, DeMontis Sabonis won the uh, skills competition, Steph Curry won the three-point competition, and Anthony Simons won the dunk contest, but all in all, it was pretty underwhelming. UFC 259 offered a completely stacked and interesting card. The early prelims started with five straight finishes, three TKOs to start, including this opening TKO from Trevin Jones, followed by a submission, another TKO by Kennedy not going to try to pronounce his last name, and then finally ending with a unanimous decision. The regular prelims started with this TKO comeback by Kai Kara France over Rogerio Bontorin with five seconds remaining in the first round, and then ended with three decisions, two unanimous and one split decision. The prelims boasted two fighters considered some of the best in the sport's history, two former title contenders. The first of which, Joseph Benavidez, uh, he just fought for the flyweight championship back in the middle of 2020. He lost to Oscar Oskarov by unanimous decision. So that means Oskarov should be the number one flyweight contender after Devison Figueredo and Brandon Moreno run it back later this year. And Joseph Benavidez was previously 15 and one in non-title fights. He loses this one and was previously considered one of the best fighters in UFC history to never win a championship. Next up was Dominic Cruz, who is a former bantamweight championship. He won by split decision over Casey Kenny. Um, for some reason, a judge scored this in favor of Casey Kenny, um, but you know you can see from the stats that Dominic Cruz pretty much you know won this fight fair and square i don't know what that judge was thinking uh the eye test shows you that dominic cruz was winning too not just based on stats but dominic cruz his last four fights were all for titles spanning four years after his initial retirement he was the bantamweight champion back in 2016 losing the title and then came back in 2020 to fight henry cejudo before cejudo retired but uh, more on Cejudo in just a little bit. But it was a really good prelim as well. Next up was the main card, which offered a lot of excitement, but got underway in an underwhelming fashion, in my opinion. Alexander Rockage won via unanimous decision over Tiago Santos, but it's just not what you expect from heavyweights. You expect a lot of hard hitting, but in this one, it was just a lot of inactivity. Luckily, it was followed up by four really good fights, the first of which was Islam Mahachev versus Drew Dober, and Khabib Nurmagomedov was in the corner of fellow Dagestani Russian fighter Islam Mahachev as he got the um, submission victory via arm triangle a minute and 37 seconds into the third round. Many think that Mahachev is a better pure wrestler or grappler than Khabib and that he'll be the next to run the lightweight division. So that's really something to look forward to in the coming, um, the coming years from Islam Mahachev. The first championship fight of the night featured Pewter Jan making his first defense of his bantamweight belt against Aljamain Sterling. And unfortunately for Pewter Jan, he was disqualified with this intentional illegal knee against Aljamain Sterling with 4 minutes and 29 seconds remaining in the fourth round. Pewter Jan was up on two scorecards, 29-28 with Aljamain Sterling up 29-28 on one card. 
but um, the eye test shows you that it was pretty much pure Jan's fight. The stats are a little bit closer than you think. Um, other than accuracy, pure Jan was more accurate. Uh, and you could see that Aljamain Sterling was gassing towards the end of the fight, but the knee was obviously illegal. Uh, referee Mark Smith audibly said that Aljamain Sterling was grounded, and then Jan, who's ironically known by the fight name No Mercy, threw the knee a few seconds later. A lot was made out of the disqualification. Aljamain Sterling becomes the first fighter to win a belt by DQ, but it was the right call. It was a terrible knee. I don't know why Pewter Jan threw it. Um, apparently, somebody in his corner told him to. You can see the hesitancy on Pewter Jan's face, but he threw it anyway, and he loses his belt. They'll undoubtedly run it back, uh, but there is something to be said for former double champ Henry Cejudo seemingly announcing his return. Henry Cejudo, as I mentioned earlier, retired after his May 9th, 2020 fight against Dominic Cruz. And that would definitely be a big money fight, uh, which Henry Cejudo has been looking for since retiring. But I agree with Ariel Helwani and Daniel Cormier that the bigger money fight would be Aljamain Sterling running it back with Peter Jan to see that he's the real champion. In the co-main event, Amanda Nunes pretty much easily defended her featherweight championship, submitting Megan Anderson via triangle choke with an armbar two minutes and three seconds into the first round. As you can see here, uh, Megan Anderson would have broken her arm or would have went to sleep had she not tapped out as Amanda Nunes had not one but two submissions locked in. She was up 19 to 2 in total strikes and it was a complete domination. Amanda Nunes, you know, acknowledged that there isn't much competition at featherweight. Um, so you got to wonder what's next for her. A lot of people have been clamoring for a champ champ fight between her and Valentina Shevchenko at 135 pounds, 135 being bantamweight in um, women's division and Valentina Shevchenko holding the flyweight championship at the moment. Uh, Shevchenko does have to defend her belt against Jessica Andrade at UFC 261 on April 24th, so no idea if she'll continue to hold the belt as Jessica Andrade is a really good uh, con competitor, contender in that fight. But, you know, either way, it's going to be a while before we see Amanda Nunes fighting again as, you know, 135 doesn't have much competition for her either. And last but not least, the main event featuring Jan Blachowicz putting his light heavyweight championship on the line against middleweight champion Israel Adesanya, who was looking to become just the fifth double champ in UFC history. Unfortunately, he didn't get it done, losing by unanimous decision, but it was a tremendous fight. Jan Blachowicz makes his first successful title defense, and Israel Adesanya loses his first fight in the UFC. He was previously 20 and 0, but as he said after the fight, you know, he he dares to dream big and he did just that. It was a really good fight, but unfortunately the judges um really really underscored Israel Adesanya in this one. Jan Blahovich won 49-46 on one judge's card and 49-45 on the other two judges cards, losing the fifth round 10-8, which uh, warrants complete domination and Israel Adesanya wasn't completely dominated in this fight. The stats show that Jan Blahovich was considerably outlanding Israel Adesanya, but the eye test shows that it was a really close fight. I thought that Izzy won two rounds and that Jan Blahovich won two rounds going into that fifth. I thought that Israel Adesanya was winning the beginning of the fifth round until he got taken down. And that's where the difference came. Oh, there's the clinch. Oh, look at that. Oh, beautiful take Beautiful down. double leg by Jan Blachowicz. Oh, oh, there it is. There it is. Jan Blachowicz had seven minutes and six seconds of control time and was three of five on takedowns. Um, Jan Blachowicz obviously weighed in at 205, but on a regular day and in the octagon weighs about 225 compared to Israel Adesanya who weighed 200 on the dot or 201 half pound. But 
you know, he really just, Jan Blachowicz really just used his weight to an advantage. He waited until the championship rounds, which I didn't think it would get into. Uh, he waited into the championship rounds to go to his grappling, to go to his wrestling, and it paid off. He got the takedown and three plus minutes of control in the fourth round, and then he got the takedown and two and a half minutes of control in the fifth round. Where I could say that the judges might have scored that a 10 8 was Jan Blachowicz um, finally getting uh, top mount, full mount in the final 15 seconds of the fight, but. That doesn't warrant a 10-8 in my opinion. Uh, Israel Adesanya wasn't completely dominated in this one. Anyway, Israel Adesanya says he will return to 205 again at some point, but he wants to go back to middleweight 185 and quote, rule that expletive with my iron black fist. So obviously the the sense of humor that we're looking for out of Israel Adesanya, the, um, the big quotes and just the the uh, the sportsmanship so it was a great fight i'd love to see him go back to 205 eventually unfortunately we won't be seeing the john jones fight that we had been wanting to see for a while but israel adesanya is still a goat i don't know why people are are trying to take that away from him now you know he dared to be great going up to a heavier weight division and he looked pretty good um other than that jan blahovich says he'd like to make his next uh, defense of the light heavyweight championship against Glover Deshera, saying that he deserves the next shot. So that's the next fight to make. The last thing for today's episode is some news from the Burgundy and Gold. As the Washington football team has placed the franchise tag on right guard Brandon Sheriff for the second consecutive season. After earning $15 million for 2020, Sheriff's 2021 salary will be $18 million, marking an increase of 20%. The team can still reach a long-term agreement with Brandon Sheriff as the deadline for that is July 15th, but franchise tagging him ensures that Brandon Sheriff won't hit free agency as the deadline for the franchise tag was today. Sheriff's salary for 2021 looks to be $18 million, but the team still could sign him to that long-term deal, as I mentioned. And if they do that, they could uh, make his contract back-end heavy, saving a little bit more money in 2021 so that they can go out and spend more money. Um, the $18 million only takes about a third of their cap space, but... Overall, they still could do some more with that. But that is all I have for today's episode. Thank you for tuning in. God bless.